Well, if you're new to astrophotography, sooner or later you're going to start to do some narrowband imaging. Now, narrowband imaging is used to bring out the more detail, it eliminates noise pollution, and you can actually image when the moon is out. This video is not about narrowband imaging per se. There are a couple of awesome recent videos on what and why you should do narrowband imaging. The first one is by Trevor Jones from Astro Backyard. And if you're watching this channel, you probably already know about it, uh, Trevor. I was actually one of his first thousand subscribers. And here's the link to his video. The other one is by Queeve, the Lazy Geek. He is a very knowledgeable individual and he's been producing many, many unique videos. And here's a link to his video. All right, there are also tons of very good uh, processing uh, narrowband imaging videos out there as well. So what I really want to talk to you about is the ionized light that we actually see from these uh, from these nebulas or nebulae, I never get the word right. We have a pandemic to thank for this video as I have all my spectroscopy stuff at home since we are doing remote learning. I'm a chemistry teacher by day and astrophotographer by night. <laughs> so I have all my stuff here at the, here at the house right now. Um, most of us don't have gas discharge tubes or and stuff like that or diffraction pay, uh, diffraction grading at, at their house but I do right now so I figured I'd do a, a real quick video or I don't know how quick it's going to be on spectroscopy and what we actually see with these uh, nebula. Anyways I'm Kurt Zepatello and you're watching AstroQuest 1. Okay, so what do I have for my bag of tricks? I have here a gas discharge tube, and this particular tube holds hydrogen gas under low pressure. Most of the nebula out there contain hydrogen gas. They also may contain oxygen and sulfur as well, and may contain other things too. But typically when we do narrowband imaging, we just look for hydrogen, sulfur, and oxygen. Now you may have heard this terminology, this hydrogen alpha, hydrogen beta, H2 regions, O3, and sulfur 2, S2. I'm going to get into all that terminology later as well uh, because guess what? The chemists, the physicists, and the astronomers all have different terms that mean the same thing to add to the confusion. Okay, what else do I have? I I've also got this thing. This is the diffraction grating, and you can actually see some of the oh, you can see some of the rainbow effect. It does the same thing as a prism, so you you can see the Roy G Biv, and this is caused by the uh, normal light. Okay, and the last thing over here is the actual uh, power source for the hydrogen gas discharge tube. Okay, I put the discharge tube inside the power source, and I'm going to use electricity to ionize the hydrogen atoms. Now, normally inside nebula, the thing that causes the ionization is UV light from a nearby star or something like that. But, as I said, I'm going to use electricity. Okay, here goes. Turn out that light, and I'm going to turn it on. Now, what you're seeing, it looks somewhat reddish, pinkish, but I'm actually going to use my other camera to get a closer shot on it because it's not doing it justice. But let me just put this in front of it so you get an idea of what's happening here. Now, you can see I put the diffraction grating on and off to the, um, the side here. Oh, can you see that with my finger? I ah, probably can't see my finger. But um, you, off to the side, you can see the there's like a red, bluish, a light bluish. There's actually a dark blue and there's a violet color there. Let's take a look at it with my other camera too. Okay, well here's that hydrogen gas. And let me adjust the, the sensitivity down because it's way overexposed and all you were seeing was white light. Here's what I'm actually seeing. It's more like a pinkish uh, glow. 
Now the reason it's not red like you would normally think is because it's actually a combination of different colors. And here I'm going to turn up the sensitivity. And now you can see those bands. There's a nice red band, there's a turquoise band, there's a deep blue band, and there's also a violet band in there, but you really can't see that. But those four colors combine and they form that pinkish glow uh, that you get. The, the reason it's pink is because it's a combination and then you run it through the diffraction grating and it separates them. So that's that. So I'm going to talk about what's going on here in the next part of this video and I'll do that on the computer so I can show you some more diagrams and whatnot. Okay, here we go. Okay, how does this work? Well, here's our hydrogen gas discharge tube. Produces that purpley pink light, runs through a prism. In my case, I used a diffraction grating, and it separates it into a red line at 656 nanometers, turquoise at 46, a blue line at 434, and a purple line at 410 nanometers. And there's actually a fifth purple line, but hardly anyone ever sees that. So why does it do this? Well, to answer that, we're going to use a model of the atom, a hydrogen atom, by Niels Bohr, the great phys the Danish physicist around 1900. And his model is a real simplistic model. It works well for hydrogen. That's the only model atom it worked for, however. That's why they invented quantum mechanics uh, subsequently. But anyways, what he said was the electrons are found in these energy levels surrounding the atom, first second, third, fourth, and on to infinity. But anyways, what you can do, <clears throat> hydrogen only has one electron, and that sits in ground state. It's normally happy. But then you feed it some energy. It absorbs energy. It could be any type of energy, light, electrical energy, you name it. It'll absorb it, knocks it into a higher energy level, so then it's said to be ionized, or it's in an excited state. But electrons, you know, it might be when they're excited, they're out there having a good old time dancing at the Saturday night party, but eventually they like to poop out and go back down to lower energy levels. Well, when the electron goes from the third energy level down to the second energy level, it releases a red photon, okay? And we can measure that, that energy. We also, we know the, we know the wavelength was 656 nanometers, and we can Put it into this equation right here where you have the Planck's constant times the speed of light divided by the wavelength. I've got those values over here 626 negative 34 joule seconds is Planck's constant, speed of light is 3 times 10 to 8 meters per second, and 656 nanometers. And you get 3 times 10 to the 19th joules. For those of you that are wondering, geez, we use, I think we use electron volts sometimes for energy, at least with spectroscopy. And that's because they use a conversion factor. One electron volt is equal to 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19th joules. That comes from the uh, charge of an electron. Uh, charge has a unit called coulombs, and that's what a coulomb is. So anyways, you take that uh, energy in joules and you divide it by 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19th joules, and you're going to get 1.9 electron volts. Much easier to use electron volts rather than worrying about with scientific notation. Okay, moving right along. We've got a larger version of the Bohr model, and here's that transition, that red transition from third to second, turquoise transition, fourth to second, fifth to second gives that blue transition, and sixth to the second energy level gives a purple transition. That's all going down to the second energy level. But what about going down to ground state. Well, it turns out they sure the electrons sure do that as well. And uh, it's going to be an identical pattern. The only problem is it's in the ultraviolet region and we can't see it. If you had an ultraviolet detector, you could see those transitions. We call that the Lehman series. So the Lehman series is the uh, it takes place in the UV range. Same transitions take place in the uh, going down to the third energy level, but that's in the infrared region. Again, you can't see it, but if you had an infrared detector, you'd see those transitions. That's called the passion series. And by the way, the transitions that take place in the visible region, which we see, that's called the Balmer series. Okay, and here's my 
spectrum, the spectral lines that I produced. And this red line, that's the 656.3 nanometers. That's the transition from the third energy level to the second energy level. And that's called the H-alpha line. So when somebody says they have an H-alpha filter, that's what they're looking at. They're looking at that particular red color. If somebody uses hydrogen beta, so there are amateur ph photographers and amateur photographers sometimes might use, uh, look for hydrogen beta, that transitions at 486.1 nanometers, and that's from the fourth to the second energy level. That one's not as common as this one. And the other lines, the, the other blue and the violet lines are even less common, so we don't really look at those. And moving on to this, this little diagram shows all the really common narrowband filters that we use in amateur astronomy. Here's, again, here's hydrogen beta, 46 nanometers. Here's oxygen at 500 nanometers. Here's hydrogen alpha at 656.3 nanometers and sulfur at 672.4 nanometers. Okay, now what's what's up with this sulfur S2 and oxygen 3 business? And you may have heard H2. Sometimes they talk about these hydrogen 2 regions. Well, it turns out that's what astronomers and spectroscopers, that's their designation. They say hydrogen 1, with a Roman numeral 1, that's hydrogen in its ground state. And if it's ionized, that's when they say the 2. That's where the 2 comes from. But that really means that the atom is ionized with only one electron being excited. So that's what H2 refers to. So if somebody says, I'm, I'm looking at the H2 region, they're actually looking at hydrogen alpha and hydrogen beta because that's it's all part of just the one electron being excited. Okay, what about this oxygen business? Well, again, if it's just... Roman numeral 1, that's oxygen's ground state. And if it's O2, the Roman numeral 2, that means one electron is excited. But what about O3? That means it's doubly ionized oxygen. That means two electrons are ionized. And when that happens, it gives off, uh, one of the lines it gives off is this greenish line at 500 nanometers. Now this really doesn't happen here on Earth normally. You don't really see this transition. It's said to be forbidden. What, what it really means is it's just not common on Earth because the oxygen density is just so great. Out in space, these nebula, the oxygen density is very low, and you do indeed see this, this spectral line. If anybody can explain that better than me, feel free to put it in the comments. If you're a real good physics person and you understand this, please put it in the comments uh, with this oxygen and forbidden lines. Sulfur, sulfur again, that's fine. The spectrospheres have, uh, again, S1 is the ground state and S2, that means one electron is ionized. So this is a transition that takes place. Okay. And I believe that's all I want to say. Thank you for indulging me and sorry if I'm tongue twisting over everything. I tried to do this in one uh, take. And now I'm going to show you some more playtime with some more spectral lines and stuff like and spectroscopy and stuff like that so stay tuned okay for my final act i want to show you two other spectral things the first thing i'm going to show you is i have a few more uh, four more gases i can show you so i'll take a look at those right now all right so once again this is that hydrogen and i can put the Thing up there so you can see the hydrogen spectrum. All right, I'm going to change that out. The next gas I'm going to put in here is helium. So helium is the second most abundant element in the universe next to hydrogen. And here's the spectral colors for helium. Okay. All right. Next. We're gonna do, here's oxygen. Doesn't really look all that impressive. But uh, let's see if that gives off a spectral color. Yeah, it's really quite dim here anyway, so. Yeah, you can see a little bit, but it's it's much dimmer than the than the other gases that I should. Last but not least, I have a very familiar gas that you guys would probably recognize this. 
Oh, and this is actually neon, so you can see how really brilliant uh, neon is. And let's see what these spectral colors are. Look at that. It's yeah, pretty much everything's in the um, red and yellows and oranges. So, anyways, those are the those are the spectral colors, and I'm going to show you something else in a second. Okay, for my final little trick or little demo, I'm going to show you how a nebula gets lit up by using UV light. Okay, I got my little UV light here. I'm going to shut out the lights and I'm going to reorient everything and I'll show you what I'm talking about. Alright, so these are just some ordinary rocks that have some certain minerals in it. This has opalite in it. This has fluorite, scapolite, calcite, willemite, and opal. And let's see what happens when I use some UV light on these things. They're pretty ordinary right now with just a regular white light, but I'm going to turn out the lights now. So here it goes. Okay, you can see what happens already. Right, that's starting to look like a nice greenish. That's really looks pretty neat too. And look at that one over there. That's the uh, scapolite. Yeah, brilliant yellow, and then here's this calcite. Wow, look at that. All right, here's a wilmanite. And finally, the opal. These look really nice. And this is exactly what happens with a nebula. The atoms get ionized. The electrons jump up to higher energy levels and back down to lower energy, uh, energy levels, and that's when they give off these characteristic colors. Well, that's all I have for you for tonight. I hope you enjoyed my little uh, demos here, and we'll see you next time.